Hello and good evening, everybody. Um, I want to thank you for joining us tonight for the inaugural program and the Active Voice Conversations at the Intersection of Art, Community, and Social Justice series. My name is Eva Rodriguez, um, the Exhibition Program Production Manager at the Armory Center for the Arts. And I want to welcome you uh, all to this first conversation titled Lockdown One Year Later where I'm joined by uh, artist William Camargo and uh, Dan McCleary, the artist, uh, founder, and executive director of Art Division. Um, I, I do want to make this a little bit of a, I know this virtual space can be a little uh, uh, isolating and strange, but uh, feel free to use the chat and uh, pop in with a message, uh, greeting everybody, um, introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, uh, we will we'll be monitoring the chat for questions and any discussion that you want to uh, bring up. So uh, if there's anything uh, uh, you want to um, uh, include in there, just feel free to do so. I do want to, uh, before we start the discussion, I do want to acknowledge the land that I'm broadcasting from and the land that the Armory occupies. Um, we at the Armory acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Tongva people. And we recognize the Tongva people as the caretakers, as well as the current and future inhabitants of the land that we occupy. And we'd like to pay them uh, our deepest respects. Um, because this is the first of these kind of uh, these, this program series, Active Voice, I do want to kind of set the stage and uh, and talk a little bit about how this program developed, at least for me. Um, I was, I'm, I'm a new father. Uh, my wife and I just had a, a baby last July. So we were already preparing, uh, we were already nesting uh, by the time that the lockdown orders came into effect. Uh, so we were already kind of preparing to just uh, be by ourselves, just us, me, me, my wife, and our new baby and the immediate family. But uh, then this kind of huge global event happened and kind of forced the entire world into like this, this kind of uh, forced isolation. Uh, and so as my personal immediate world was closing in on itself, everybody was going through like a similar but different experience. Um, and that kind of, I've over the past year, because I'm, uh, Kind of just been tending to my family and being here isolated. Uh, I, I really did feel disconnected from the my colleagues and the field, the arts. Um, so, uh, but during this year, so much happened, and I feel like there was so much to talk about. And there is now that I'm can, the, now that we have like the permission to kind of be a little more outside and. Um, interacting with with our uh, our colleagues, um, I want to continue some some of the discussions, some of the reflections that we've had, uh, both internally at the Armory. We've had some wonderful discussions, um, and with colleagues, with artists, friends, and um, some community organizing uh, efforts that that have happened. Uh, so I really want to. Um, uh, continue the conversations of these topics, because I think there's a uh, um, uh, uh, a kind of a, a momentum that we have going that, that I want to continue, uh, even as we kind of things start to reopen or quote unquote, go back to normal, which I, I, that's a, 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 a term that I want to contest through this series. Um, and so in, in, in that spirit of reflection, I, I do want to spend just a little bit of time uh, to, for for a, a moment of silence, just to reflect on um, the year that has happened. I was actually thinking of, of doing something that I did at a previous meeting was um, showing some images of the past year. But um, I think in uh, some of that is a little uh, triggering and it just, um, it, it actually just looking at some of those images did kind of a, um, trigger some of those same emotions. So I think some quiet reflection would just at the beginning of the meeting will kind of let us um, kind of get back into that that headspace just in some of the, uh, like we, we had a, a, a year of um, where we uh, had a presidential vote, 
the uprisings that happened um, at the Capitol, but also like the the the, the demonstrations against uh, uh, police violence and um, in support of Black Lives. So all of these things kind of, and then more recently, just as things are reopening, just we're seeing the resurgence in gun violence and the violence towards uh, Asian American and Pacific Islanders. Um, so I wanna kind of take all that energy to, and kind of just put it, hold this moment of silence so we can reflect on that and see how it feeds our discussion because a, a lot of these topics are gonna come up during the course of this Active Voice series. Um, but um, I want to just lead with a, a moment of silence to reflect on that. Thank you, thank you for joining me in this in that moment of silence. I think uh, it's just uh, uh, really grounding to to um, know that we're all kind of virtually um, kind of processing all this emotion and and um, all these ideas uh, together. Uh, now, I, I'd like to introduce our uh, our two speakers today. Our two other um, panelists. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce uh, William Camargo. He's an artist, educator, visual artist, uh, arts advocate born and raised in Anaheim, California. He holds an MFA at, uh, um, from Claremont Graduate University and a BFA from Cal State University Fullerton. His work is in response to found archives of a city through a historical art practice that manifests as series-based artworks and strategies that address geographic place. His work creates counter narratives that center communities of color. He is the current artist in residence at the Latinx project at NYU and has lectured about his work nationwide uh, at different institutions and universities. And we actually uh, met through the Armory because he was a teaching fellow. Um, he, and I believe you were the last cohort, right? But before the lockdown orders went into effect. Um, and now you are uh, Armory, uh, you do some teaching for the Armory as well. Uh, now, uh, and so, and uh, also on, the, uh, on today's um, Active Voice uh, uh, panel is Dan McCleary. He's an American artist and founder and executive director, as I mentioned earlier, of the nonprofit organization Art Division. Uh, offering professional arts training and academic and career support to young adults aged 18 to 26 in the underserved MacArthur Park community in Los Angeles. In 2014, the now 10,000 volume art division library opened for students, artists, and the community at large located at West 6th Street. And um, he can, you, if you see Dan's screen, he has a uh, uh, um, he's showing off a bit of that collection in his back uh, be, behind him. Um, as an artist, uh, uh, Dan has been featured in more than 50 solo group exhibitions throughout the US and Europe. And the subject of McCleary's paintings, drawings and prints is individuals often alone and rendered life-size engaged in daily activities at home, office, hair salon or restaurant. So yeah, thank, thank you both for joining us. We're gonna um, uh, um, start this discussion with a few uh, presentations by the, um, uh, I, I think uh, William, you're gonna uh, kick us off. He's gonna just give us a little bit of um, background on him, his practice um, and let us uh, know a little bit more about him. Uh, thank you, Heber, uh, and thanks for everyone for joining us uh, today. Um, and uh, yeah, it's going to be a quick, you know, presentation of, of my work. Uh, I'm, I think I'm still pretty young that I think uh, my career is just kind of emerging. So uh, I'm great to be in, in a conversation with Dan, who has a, had an expansive career. Um, so let me see if I can share this really quick. Uh, and I'll start with a little bit of 
of you know the work. Oh, if I can get some uh, screen sharing uh, privileges here. And like uh, Heber mentioned, I was the last uh, cohort right before uh, the shutdown. Actually, I was uh, with my coworker Danielle, who's another uh, fellow, and we actually were um, about to start teaching, and uh, we noticed that the class wasn't coming. So you know, it was kind of chaotic, and um, and and you know, that's when we for, uh, found out that there was uh, you know this kind of shutdown. Um, so it's been a, 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 you know, very kind of a year of, of tragedy of, of seeing, uh, specifically in my community uh, where I'm from, uh, Santa Ana and, and Anaheim both have the highest rates of, of COVID deaths and, and cases. And as we've seen, right, um, Black, Brown, Indigenous communities and Asian communities have been really affected by, by what's happening. Um, and you know, not surprisingly, we, we've seen, um, you know, moments like this in history, and it's not surprising that uh, there's these cycles, right? And I think um, a lot of my uh, practice does deal with history and these forgotten histories of communities, uh, you know, specifically starting from a hyper-local level. Um, and again, you know, I think I, as, as a millennial, I, we tend to kind of want to hold a lot of titles, but there's a lot of you know, navigating that we have to do, um, as, we, as we know, you know, I am a photo based artist. Uh, I do a lot of community archivism as well. Uh, advocate, which I, I chair the, the, the Commission of Heritage and Culture, and as well as, a, uh, as an educator. Um, and, uh, you know, with these times, it was, it was difficult to see how students were struggling, uh, specifically in, in, in my community, and access to internet was, was kind of a huge issue that is still not solved. Um, but I'll start with a little bit of, of my work that I still, it's super relevant to what's happening and, and it's relevant about, um, you know, we've seen history repeat itself. Um, and I always like to start off with the, this quote that has kind of navigate, has propelled me to think about my work um, aside from from what I was seeing in school, right? Which was like the canon of photography of who am I looking at? Um, what does it mean to be, you know, with an image or taking an image? Um, so I started with uh, the amazing Jennifer A. Gonzalez. Um, she states, what does it mean to have or indeed to be with an image of oneself? How is that image constructed? How is that image controlled? To have an image implies the rights of ownership. Be with an image implies the relationship of cooperation community. Um, and I think that was a, a huge uh, kind of shock to me when I went away from doing photojournalism to the work that I do now. Um, I always thought my work as, as more of uh, having conversation with the community that I was photographing, uh, especially if I wasn't from that community. Um, and, you know, I, I finished uh, a six, seven year career of photojournalism uh, because I think I was really contemplating uh, these issues of uh, equity uh, and who uh, can take a photograph uh, in a community that's not theirs. Um, and this I started during um, my grad school, actually. I, I started looking at um, archives of my own, of my own city, uh, knowing that I had this privilege to navigate, you know, going to the public library and asking uh, the archivist there, you know, can I see some archives for research purposes, et cetera. And knowing that, you know, I had that privilege aside from, you know, my parents who, who uh, don't speak English. Um, and I started seeing these stories that I never was told in, in public school, right? You know, I, I didn't know this, this happened right in the backyard of my city. Um, and, and these were all responses to those archives, right? Um, and I think a lot, about um, the validity of these stories uh, that were, that I even had to do when I was making this work, right? Having to kind of double down on the validity of the work by showing archives, by showing, um, you know, quote unquote proof of, of these happenings. Um, and I don't usually, uh, when I show this work, I don't show the archives, right? Because I, I want folks to, Kind of break down those those hegemonic structures and, and believe, uh, you know, these stories of of communities. 
Uh, but for these purposes, I, I'll definitely show you the, uh, you know, the archives that I was uh, getting these from and responding to these. Um, right, so on the left is, you know, uh, the now OC register. Uh, and uh, to the right, you know, these photographs that the city does hold on in their archives, but you know, when as, as an educator, you know, I was thinking, why wasn't I shown this work and how can I kind of navigate that and, and actually, um, you know, give these knowledges to to the, the youth that are going to these uh, systems in public schools. All right, you know, before that too, I was uh, still doing these documentations of my community um, from what I learned in school, right? Which is how to document the city it was kind of this uh, strategy and system of uh, like portraits, uh, landscapes, and kind of a street photography that kind of uh, encompassed the city. Um, but I still was thinking about how can I break that system down because that usually was um, was from someone that from the outside coming in to, to photograph these, uh, these communities. Um, so I had the luxury, right, to be grown up in a city uh, and be able to photograph in and actually have these conversations with folks. Um, and, you know, the way I work, I, I still work with film and I lug these huge cameras around. Uh, so it does take some time to set up and actually have conversations with. I don't want to just kind of parachute in. Um, and that's what usually sometimes photojournalists uh, uh, talk it as I'm going to parachute into these cities that are having these uprisings and photograph them and then go back into my uh, my comfortable life, right? Um, right, and, and I think about the archive and how, you know, there are these um, ephemeral moments too that, that we kind of forget at times. And I, and, you know, we know the histories as well. Like, you know, a lot of my friends, we kind of dig, dig around um, the histories of our communities. Uh, but these are not center focus, right? When we try to think about um, which histories are told and which are not. And we've seen that, you know, the history of um, violence against Asian and American Pacific Islanders is not nothing new. And so I think even when making this work, I was, it came back to me to thinking about this is the dangerous uh, thing about history when, when it is centered around, uh, uh, you know, the kind of like slaughter colonial history way of telling uh, stories of communities of color. Um, so every time I teach, I try to teach, you know, these kind of alternative texts to, um, and one of them is decolonizing the camera, uh, which states, right, uh, opening the archives uh, concerning the making of race and unsettling the meanings made there in terms of knowledge produced around the race equates to a burning down of the masses house. Uh, and and Mark Silly, when he talks about the master's house, he thinks about um, uh, the famous Audre Lorde essay um, that I think uh, out of maybe someone can put it down there. It's a great essay of of, uh, of, um, of what one call how can you break down a, a master's house with a master's tool, right? Um, so, you know, that's that's what one of the things that we're trying to, I'm trying to create with the way I, um, I teach and the way I, I create this work is um, how to burn down these matters house and use the remaining ashes to fertilize the soil so as to produce a liberated and fertile plot that grows out of its violent past to generate new meanings. Um, and, you know, I hope that, um, you know, these moments continue as, as we look at, um, you know, these archives that big museums hold and, uh, you know, how they were actually, you know, stolen items that they took. Um, um, you know, so that's, you know, that was the work right before the pandemic that I was, I was making. Um, and uh, I think it still told me a lot about, you know, the things that I wasn't surprised that happened uh, during this year. And, and, you know, I think for the years to come, uh, sadly, uh, but, you know, but I also was stuck at home and, and it was the first time I had been home uh, uh, in over five years. Uh, and I still kind of wanted to work, right? There was a lot of pressure of, of kind of having to, um, you know, learn a new language, learn a new instrument. Uh, but, you know, I think what I learned from uh, from this term called rascachismo, which is a, a Nahuatl term from uh, uh, my native uh, people, 
in, in Guerrero is, uh, you know, you make do with what you got. And I think it was super easy for me to kind of continue this work, um, use my own backyard. Um, you know, I, I grew up in, in uh, like Section 8 housing, so we weren't able to uh, store a lot of these things. And we finally did get a house. Um, you know, we, we were saving everything, right, as a, as a way to be resourceful. Um, you know, I see there's a lot of interconnection with a lot of communities of color that, you know, we, we definitely don't like to throw that much away because we might use it later on. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I do question my mom, like, I haven't seen you use that in like four years. So like, maybe we can throw it out. And then like two days later, we, she ends up using it saying, you know, I told you so we shouldn't throw it out. Um, so these were kind of, you know, my kind of, you know, stress relievers and also just, it was, it was a, a kind of joy that also I was able to have during this time. Uh, oh, wow, you know, my community was definitely uh, struggling and, and even uh, to this day, we've had some, uh, you know, some instances of, of death and, and, and trauma uh, in my immediate family. But, you know, there's something that I, I was um, trying to do at the time. Um, and I, you know, I, I made a whole series about it. And I think this was um, something that really kind of showed uh, how these uh, items really are powerful and kind of um, comforting as well. Um, and some of my students and, and other workshops that I've given, um, you know, I've tasked them to make some some images of, of things that they care about, things that they kind of see around their house. And um, I wasn't able to say them here, but I, I think I've shared them on Instagram. Uh, uh, they just are, are amazing. Um, so I continue um, so I could give some time to Dan definitely and this last one I think I you know I was thinking of, of what comes afterwards uh, what, what comes after this pandemic and I think again it's like you know after the 2008 um, housing crisis and and, uh, and that we saw a lot of these kind of uh, displacement and, and, and neighborhoods changing and, and I think, you know, that's that's something that we're gonna have to uh, think about as well and, and kind of fight for uh, for folks. And, you know, as you saw, housing is a huge issue in Southern California and, and we've seen uh, currently in, in Meco Park, right? The, uh, what's happening there um, with, you know, folks being kicked out of Meco Park. Um, you know, I went to go visit a couple of times to do some work with uh, the unhoused folks there. and. Um, you know, all they want is housing and, and the right to housing. Um, and, we, you know, these were taken down during the pandemic as well. I saw these pop up uh, every, you know, pretty often in every corner of, of White City as well. Um, um, and then this last thing, you know, again, I was coming from, you know, these two cities that definitely has been affected by the pandemic uh, quite a bit. And, and um, you know, I'm always, having folks, uh, you know, the last things I'm always doing in, in lectures like this is making a call to action, right? Um, that we can also help a lot of these communities that, that we're part of, that, that we, you know, we teach, uh, you know, their students. Um, so I think, uh, you know, one thing is, is joining these mutual aid efforts that are, are being kind of really effective to uh, feed, uh, feed our community and, and think about, um, uh, solidarity, right? And think about it as, as not charity work. Um, and these are some of the, you know, the folks that I do work with um, outside of, of kind of my practice, but it still kind of definitely influences my practice. Um, uh, but I think, you know, we trade is, is something that, that folks can get involved with. And, and a lot of artists, friends of mine have, you know, been part of those uh, efforts as well. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we should continue this because there is a lot of, uh, a lot of need and you know, basic food sovereignty is, is something that we see across communities of color. And I'll stop there. Oh. Uh, thank, you. thank you for that. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of topics there to to dive into in the discussion. But before we move on to the discussion, I, I want to give Dan a chance to talk a little bit about his own practice, but also art division as well. Um, and I'm especially curious because um, um, the central LA area was another 
kind of hard hit community in uh, during this this whole lockdown period. So I'm curious to see um, here um, uh, uh, about art division, but also um, how everyone's doing there now. Yeah, uh, first, just William, that was fantastic. It's a little hard for me to now switch <laughs> switch gears because I, I, your work really resonated and was so powerful and so um, provoking to my mind. So it's now I have to switch you know, <laughs> switch gears a little bit. But yeah, we're right in the midst of MacArthur Park, um, and I know Maria Galicia is here as well. And one. Um, project, Maria completely spearheaded. And Maria used to be the assistant director here. She now works at the Fisher Museum, but we made a, Z we, I had nothing to do with it. She and other uh, folks, students of arts and students from USC made a zine that was in Spanish um, as well as one in English to uh, just ex to explain how to deal with COVID. And, we, and then we, we, we put the information up on three bus stops and then a fourth bus stop, two of our students are gonna do about getting um, the vaccine because there's a lot of uh, lack of information in this community that's, uh, I mean, it's time to catch up with that. But it's one of, um, it's, it's sort of like we're so in it, it's hard to really talk about because you're just in it. I mean, I guess you could say to some degree we're coming out of it, but it's affected our students, I mean, just, um, I really resonated a lot with what William is saying because it's affected uh, families and uh, extended families and it's and our students themselves so um, and it's been um, obviously we we never stopped we've continued uh, teaching all our classes on zoom and then we allow students to come one or two per space and that's opening up a little more now but to use the space and one student um, really needed a place to work and she set up a studio in our paint studio. So necessity bred invention or poison turned into medicine, meaning because no one was here, she was able to have her own private space, which she desperately needed. And um, it's just every day, every day there's some new um, configuration of what's to do or what's happening or a uh, thing to deal with. Um, it's also, I think one of the amazing side effects of this is that we, um, because all our classes are on Zoom, we now have students from Texas, from El Paso, from Houston, from Oakland, uh, from Florida. So we're, we just let anyone take classes. How we're gonna navigate out of that is gonna be an interesting situation. But, um, you know, it's, I, I feel in some degree, the walls are coming down now or that we're, coming, seeing the other side of it, the vaccine is more uh, available to everyone. And it's unbelievable to realize how uh, racist the vaccine um, distribution was. It's so like, oh, okay, uh, that it was just not available um, in an equal way. It was just startling to, and again, one more time opening our eyes to that, but. Uh, um, anyways, I guess that's, I don't know if that answers your question ever, but it's just sort of what I'm, you know, sort of going on here. Uh, what about you? What about your own personal practice? Uh, how, how has that been? Um, it's actually been fine. I have a studio right next to the library, like, you know, a few feet away. And I live like two minutes from here. Uh, so I was able through this whole thing to just be in my studio working. and. Um, it's been fine. It's been fine for my own personal practice. I think, um, I don't even know how to describe it. It's a little schizophrenic because the work I do has not a direct bearing on my, my, my work with art division. I'm doing paint still lifes. Today I spent all day painting lilacs. That's what I did. And then had meetings in between all day or then came into the library and you know, talked with students who were three or four who were here doing their individual projects. Um, but it, it's been, um, my personal practice is I've not one thing to complain about, it's been fine. Uh, the, the switch, it's not a complaint, but I'm a figurative artist, I guess you could say. I have done no figurative work in a year because I'm not interested in painting people in masks. And, you know, I, I tried putting a plastic 
you know, working through a plastic shield and it was so awful and weird that I just, I'm just in my studio with fruit and flowers. And then, like I said, uh, all day long, again, I'm not saying this as a complaint because I actually, it's a, the life I chose and I like it. Oh, constantly interacting with the students and seeing what's up with them. And there's always something going on, um, you know, with the, with the students here. And uh, I don't know if people know what I'm talking about when I say the students, I run a program called Art Division, which we talked about. And the best way to describe it is that it's an incubator for creating. And there's no, um, we just try to give people who don't have access to otherwise to a space to create and think. And um, I've taught in many places. I've taught at USC, UCLA, Long Beach Art Center, but I, I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't do it. I needed to do this um, for various reasons, but um, it was, I don't know how to, uh, Maria, who's, her name's there. She, we founded it together along with Javier Carrillo, who's also here. Um, it was uh, something that I just wanted to do. And the, it's really interesting listening to you, William, because in a way I feel um, uh, disconnected from Los Angeles. I'm much more um, connected, well, I'm very connected to my neighborhood, which is MacArthur Park. And then I'm also connected to Oaxaca. I go to Oaxaca to work um, a lot. And in Oaxaca, there's a place called Iago, um, which is an, a library, which is the complete inspiration for our library. And I also work at a place called Casa there where I teach, but those organizations have totally influenced my work here. And, one, and then another one called Curtiduria, which is run by Demian Flores, an artist from Oaxaca, Mexico City. And we collaborate with them a lot. So I feel a little bit like I'm in spaceship, I'm here and then I'm there, but um, I'm now, that's why I said, William, I mean it, that it's hard for me to like now talk about what I'm doing because I'm actually really curious what you're doing. And, thinking about Anaheim, like I never go to Anaheim. I never go to Santa Ana. <laughs> I go there maybe once every two years, you know, I, um, but to start connecting with the communities here is something that's, you know, I live less than a mile from Echo Park. I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just curious how that's gonna, anyway, th listening to you is affecting my thought pattern. <laughs> I guess you could say it. Um, yeah, you know, that I, oh, know. sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna to say too, is that I, we work with, I would say about 25 to 50, more like 50, I guess, students. That's what I'm concerned about is their well-being and how they're doing and what the, and each one is an individual and each one has individual issues and problems. Um, and today was actually a very good day because one issue is getting them counseling. And we just, it looks like we, we were gonna sign up for a, a, a service that provides counseling for, the students, but that's been, you know, the depression and the anxiety that this has caused them is what I'm concerned about and thinking about. I'm not really thinking about the situation at Echo Park so much. It's more thinking about the mental health of individual students, you know, like that we're dealing with, but I don't look at the big picture that much. I, it's very, um, I don't know what you said, the small picture. I look at the picture of these individuals' lives. And I'm not saying that that's a good thing either. I'm, I'm seeing that there's, I, it's kind of time to open up a little bit. I mean, we, we did a thing called the Blanket Project last year where we made, we, I keep saying we, it's like we, it's a whole country made blankets that were hand woven that we brought down to the border. That came to a screeching halt with COVID. And then you think about those people down there, like they're still there, you know, they still are cold, you know, like um, it's very easy in a way for me to just look at what's in front of my face, which is our students. You know, that's, I don't look at the big picture much. I look at what's right here and what they need. So anyway, I'm just rambling. But that's uh, No, but that actually uh, kind of leads me to a kind of a connection point that I want to explore more with, with both of you is the, the, this notion of community you, Dan, you talked about like um, kind of focusing down on like each individual student and like their need for space, what their needs are. Um, and in MacArthur Park, one of the most densely uh, populated areas of Los Angeles, space is a huge deal. And especially there's like multi-generational family uh, dwelling under one roof. Um, 
uh, in that area, it's pretty common. Um, but um, uh, but also, um, uh, William, you mentioned the um, the huge impact that COVID has had, like one of the record numbers. Um, but uh, William, with you, I wanted to ask a little bit more about your position as an archivist and like as like from behind the lens as, as a photographer documenting how that how that's changed like tonally like thematically right now um, especially since you are so involved in your community if there's I, I know this uh, there's quite a bit of artists who have to turn to like um, document the uh, like all the like the tents that, that, that have been coming up in the city um, and or also or the lines for the um, COVID vaccines um, but what, 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 how does, how has your kind of lens shifted in this, in this time? Yeah, I mean, I've, if I was still a photojournalist, I think I would have been all over, like, you know, I, I think it, I stopped kind of doing that work because I think it was, you know, I just wasn't uh, thinking that I was going to represent them correctly because, uh, you know, I had editors that, that didn't live in the neighborhoods that I was photographing. Um, so that representation was something that, you know, that I think was, um, that I've always was conflicted in. So I went back to what I, what I was, you know, what I did and when I was in community colleges, I procrastinated a lot. And I think the only people that were available to me was my household. And, you know, I was in that situation, like being back in my household with, in, in the, you know, intergenerational household. and. Um, you know, I think my parents got annoyed with me again from like when I was 18 and, you know, uh, but this time I was like, you know, lugging that big camera and, and you know, they were telling me stories of, of, of our family of, you know, uh, of, and, and also like the updates that we're getting from, from our family in Mexico. And I think I definitely saw that shift um, that I did not have when I was a younger, like, you know, teenager, um, especially with, you know, how, you know, toxic machismo can be is, is these conversations with my father were, weren't something that they really had when I was younger. Um, and when I do like mutual aid work, I was like, I never take my camera. A lot of, you know, the senoras in the community ask me what I do for a living and they kind of like get surprised, like, cause they never knew, right. That was not some, that was not nothing that I, that I kind of like lugged around with me, uh, when doing that work, uh, you know, I wasn't out photographing like me taking pictures of me giving food to them, right? Because again, I was thinking about just, you know, getting them food um, without even, uh, you know, knowing, you know, as, as some, someone that just has that privilege to be able to navigate these spaces and able to get them food, um, you know, I didn't have to bring my art in there to, uh, obviously it influences, me, influences the work I do uh, because I look at like, you know, why is this neighborhood brown and why is that neighborhood black? Um, you know, and then making connections with, oh yeah, right. Segregation and redlining um, has shown uh, these, uh, you know, they're not coincidences, right? These are the reasons why uh, a lot of our community is dying. And, and, and um, you know, um, I think it shifted that way when I was looking at my work more, uh, more closely and also looking at the community more closely uh, you know I was away from it for a while and I think um, I wanted to bring what I had learned in and uh, while I was in Chicago um, you know they were centering their their histories they're centering uh, uh, you know they were looking looking at work that was like a liber uh, you know more about liberating uh, than actually just kind of being there as a representative of a community So, and I'm, I'm really interested to see how this, how your notion of archive kind of changes and like this, like going back to this, like personal documentation and, and really personal research, like into your own history, like it influences your work. Um, I, I, seeing the time right now, I do wanna um, take an opportunity to uh, mention that um, part as part of this series, I, I really want, um, uh, the folks who are joining me to uh, have an opportunity to lift up uh, something uh, that in relation to the theme of the discussion and also 
to bring up something they'd like to tear down, like an issue, uh, a practice, something that um, they, they've observed that they'd like to uh, tear down uh, as, um, also in relation to the theme. Um, Dan, uh, I'm gonna start with you. Um, uh, what, what is something that you've seen across the, this moment of lockdown uh, that, that you um, would like to lift up and then something you'd like to, to tear down? So for, um, just for, for everybody viewing, my, the examples that I shared in my uh, preliminary conversations where uh, what, what I'd like to lift up is like the idea of this lockdown period as like a sort of incubation, a time for incubation where um, many of us, uh, if we were privileged enough to have our space and um, and and time to to consider um, our position, uh, we we'd have a, a time to learn and activate different um, uh, um, different parts of ourselves that we uh, normally would not have taken the time or slowed down enough to access. Uh, and then something that I'd I'd, I'd, um, I'd hope to tear down is like this as we talk about reopening is. Um, this notion of going back to normal and how uh, there was no, no uh, for a lot of us that normal did not was not beneficial and it did not serve us. So um, we're not in a hurry, or at least I am not in a hurry to go back to that to that idea of normal. Um, that's such a big loaded thing, and I, I think. Um, to uh, the main thing to tear down is the the glaring racism that exists. I'm just going to say in our city because I don't, you know, this is where I live. Uh, I guess you could, I mean, William you live in Anaheim, but just in LA, the uh, inequity here is just disgusting, and it's just right in our face right now. Uh, I think that would tear that down like immediately. Um, the ineffectiveness of the government is just insane. That. What's going on in Echo Park is a reflection of what's going on everywhere. Um, that it's, I think the, um, it's psychotically insane that there's not housing. It's, it's just, how can you be sitting in a restaurant having a lovely meal while people around you are in dumpsters looking for food? It's become this uh, disconnect that I really do think has made us all slightly crazy. And I think, um, I would love to tear that down. <laughs> I also think the powerlessness, which is not necessary of individuals, I think that, okay, this is now a little wackadoodle, but I really think they should bring direct the draft. Everyone should have to do a year of community service from the age 18 to 19, everybody. There's no getting out of it. Everyone, every, there's no escaping it. And that doesn't mean you have to go to war. If you wanna to go to war, you could do that, I guess, but do a year, you have to do a year of, of helping the homeless. You, and, and if you're adventurous and wanna go work up in national parks, putting out fires, do that. But to empower everyone, because I think there's a sense of powerlessness that we all have that we are kind of powerless. I mean, that, and that even our government feels powerless. Like, I guess our mayor's a nice guy. What is he doing? Does he not drive by Echo Park? You know, uh, Mitch McConnell seems like a, not Mitch McConnell, what's his name? <laughs> I forget Mitch his name. Carroll. Yeah, what is he doing? I know he's trying, I guess you could say he's trying. It's like, just get it together. <laughs> like find places for these people to live there. It's not that po impossible, but I think that there's, um, th that's what I would like to tear down. It's just, it, it's just so like, um, I don't know what the equivalent would be, except maybe France during Marie Antoinette times, like, where there's such a disconnect of the haves and the have nots that's just gotta end. It's just ridiculous. And um, anyway, so that I'd like to tear down to lift up. I would, I don't know, <laughs> lift up. I guess that's the same thing. Lift up like a sense of looking at each other and listening to each other. I think one wacky, I was talking to, saying it to Irene a little bit. She gave a talk a couple nights ago and I learned more about her from Zoom than I did like meeting her in person actually. <laughs> that, that I think that Zoom is actually making people connect. That you're, I you know I mentioned that we have, you know, wonderful students from Oakland, a great young woman. Another thing is they're, they're all women. Like it seems like women who are stuck in these godforsaken towns <laughs> are reaching out and joining um, art division for a spell. And it's really lovely. It's really interesting to meet the broader community 
Um, because I think, uh, so that's, I, I don't want to lift up. I don't no, know if I'm answering. Yeah, you, well, you actually also answered it in the previous view and this, like, uh, this feeling of powerlessness, I think, is, is shared amongst a lot of people right now because we had, we, 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 like, we're, it was strongly suggested for us to be in isolation and quarantine for the past year. It was um, mandated. Um, and so that, that with, with that came a loss of like um, kind of in the independence, free will. And, um, and a lot of us kind of internalized that and um, did feel a sense of powerlessness. But uh, I think there, there is this kind of, uh, a lot of people kind of took that and turned it around and kind of uh, hopefully are, are, are using it to like the people you mentioned, they take class, take classes somewhere else in, in, in across the globe or learning a new skill or something. Uh, um, William, what about you? What do you, what would you like to lift up or tear down? Um, I mean, I think tear down is, is, I think I was looking at, um, you know, seeing all the, the stuff from uh, the Instagram account change the museum and, and decolonize this place. Um, I mean, I wanted to tear down those, you know, those structures as well and, and kind of, you know, reimagine them. And, you know, I think if it wasn't, I think if it wasn't for this moment, like, I don't know if I would have been invited to speak at Stanford, at Syracuse and, and, and all these places. Is it, I mean, for me, it was like, was it just about having someone, you know, of color in, in like in their lecture series or was it? Some actual honesty of, of um, you know, they actually like the work, um, because we've seen this again, you know, like the arts um, kind of um, fetishizing of, of of you know communities of color and, and artists that are that belong to those uh, communities. And uh, I mean, another example was like you know the Whitney Biennial in, in 1994 and um, or 93 or 94, I think it was like. You know, right? You know, a couple of years after um, the LA riots, and you know, I, I definitely want to see us continue uplifting, um, you know, black, Latina, uh, Asian American, Pacific Islander femmes, um, and listening to them because I think uh, we haven't done that enough. Um, and I think uh, you know, once once we listen to them and, and actually really listen to them to think about what you know the issues that we're we're facing right now um you know me as a uh cis passing dude it's like i'd rather you know you know uplift them uh, more often um because i think um you know they do have to deal with a lot i think we they're great problem solvers and you know my mom is, is one of the strongest women i know and uh and uh yeah because she's still you know, you know, from the stories that I've heard during the pandemic, it's like I couldn't believe what she went through to get over here, um, and you know, for you know her son to be an artist, uh, and then she tells me to like go do some yard work, and I was like, okay, damn, <laughs> uh, you know. But th that thing, yeah, you know, that what I want to continue seeing is is you know, you know, representation that actually means like liberation and, and not just. Um, you know, representation that, you know, I'm not, if I'm not being collected, if I'm not, you know, into these institutions that I'm being invited to, then, you know, I'm only getting, um, you know, those an hour and, and that's it, right? They kind of, you know, forget about, um, but what like equity really means, so. I actually want to lift up something that, uh, um... Uh, your work with, with the armory over the lockdown, or the image that you produced in for the action uh, at Pasadena um, for uh, after the killing of Anthony McLean. Um, that was, I think, uh, for me, I still have it um, hanging on my window. I think it was just like this moment of, like, in, in this moment of separateness, um, it made us, even at, at the armory, just all kind of feel like a little bit empowered to kind of show that image and show our solidarity with with the, that movement at the time uh, how did um i think you shared a little bit but uh um how did you um kind of come up with that image and, and get involved with it? yeah i mean i think you know i wasn't 
documenting and, and uh, a friend of mine that um, took that image, Al Qaeda uh, Ramirez. Um, you know, I think we were just, uh, you know, thinking of the the unity that that uh, we had missed out for so long, and and you know, sadly, tragedy is, is you know what kind of woke us up, um, and I think it shouldn't be like that, right? And I think. Um, you know, we, I think at that time we didn't feel powerless, right? Like we felt that, that there's some change that we can, uh, we can kind of create um, and, and having like all of us in unison, you know, of, of all skin colors, um, lifting our hand, you know, lifting our, our, our fist. And, um, you know, there was a great like uh, moments of, of, of what, you know, what was happening is kind of like trying to, um, you know, give the back, the mic back to the folks that really, uh, really need to have it. Um, um, and I think, um, you know, I think I, I'm trying to, uh, like, trying to figure out, like, a, you know, like a, a saying of, um, for the poster was something that also was kind of um, in unison with, with what was, what I was hearing in the community when I was out marching, uh, and what I was hearing in the streets too. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to open it up to um, questions. If anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to either drop them in a chat or, or if you feel so compelled, if you want to un unmute yourself, um, I think uh, if there's anything um, or any just if you want to, if you would like to share any kind of uh, uplift, any kind of uh, lockdown experiences or either personally or in community. Uh, but I, I do want to thank uh, uh, William while, while we, while we um, wait for if there's any questions uh, um, for including his call to action. Uh, that's something that I want to kind of highlight and um, through this uh, Active Voice series, it, it's ca called Active Voice because I, I think there's like a, a level of passivity with um, some art, arts programming. There's like we talk about the subject but there's no action on it. So part of uh, this series is gonna encourage us to kind of take action on the subjects that we discuss and bring to the, bring to the conversation. So um, uh, thank you uh, William, for sharing those, those links. And, and I'll give you the opportunity, uh, Dan, if you uh, wanna include any calls to action for um, in relation to, to the subjects you shared, or if you want, I know there's an exhibition opening soon at, at, at Art Division, or and I think it's view, available online as well, right? There's an exhibit now called Memoria, and it's a um, you know meditations on the journey from the south to the north by uh, our students, and it's also it's half that and half artists from Oaxaca about um, the same thing of meditations on that journey. Uh, that's up until about the through April, and you can make an appointment and just come see it. And I'd, I'd, I'd love everyone to just come. I mean, just see the gallery and also see the library and the you know the print studio. And then we're going to open in uh, mid May to June with a, an exhibit of this is our tenth year of art division, and an exhibit of ten years of art division. You know, it's like student work from the past 10 years or work by students who've come through the program for the past 10 years. Um, I think that's my call to action. <laughs> Leslie has a question. William, um, thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, I've seen lots of the images on Instagram, but it's really great to hear um, your narrative behind it. Um, and I would love at some point to share with you my history, my family history in Santa Ana. Um, my grand, my great grandfather and my great grandmother owned a nursery. Um, and I recently came across um, some paperwork, some very old paperwork. Um, they had to close down the nursery um, when they were, um, evacuated um, in 1940, I guess it's 1943. Um, so I have all the paperwork of all the losses, um, everything that was confiscated. Um, and I think it might be 
of interest. I'm wondering, did you come across any Japanese American history in your in your archival work? Yeah, I did. Um, I I was working with um, a historian in the in the public library here, and, and we you know we showed some stuff, and you know there was uh, actually some uh, a grad student that that wants to tackle like that history, Asian American, Japanese, you know, in Orange County. Um, and I think maybe we could start with your work. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm always like, you know, folks ask me like, how do I start like something like this? And, you know, it's always starting with, you know, with our own kind of like archives. That's how I started with mine, right? Looking at every time I would come back in the summer, I would look at my own archives and then think about Right. there's these other histories that came before I did as well. Um, uh, and I think, you know, there's um, uh, Devin Suno, like, uh, oh yeah, you guys work with Devin a lot. Like, I mean, seeing the, uh, like his, his show and, and seeing those, those images and then uh, being with him at the site at, um, at the Santa Anita was, was super powerful. And I think, you know, those were times of like solidarity and, and connection with each community. Um, uh, you know, I think, and, and, you know, those moments were like all silent too, right? There were these moments of like knowing that there's these struggles within our communities that, that we were unifying again uh, with. Um, and, and it starts with, you know, our own, our own family history. Uh, no, definitely. I, I would love to, to go over some of that work and, um, and, and look at it. And I think, yeah, there's a lot of histories that, you know, you know, Santa Ana used to have a Chinatown that got burned down and it never was rebuilt. Um, it, there was a Black Panther like uh, headquarters here as well um, uh, that got, um, you know, definitely uh, affected by COINTELPRO. Um, so there's a lot of stories to be told and I think we definitely need to, to begin telling them. Thank you, Leslie, for that question. Yeah. yeah and there is, is there any last uh, questions? If not, um, I want to invite everyone, if you happen to either um, uh, go to the exhibition at Art Division, um, visit the library, or do some um, volunteer work with uh, any of the organizations that um, William shared uh, to uh, let us know, share uh, any images, like uh, um, see what 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 action comes from these uh, calls to action. And um, if you if you can share any images with us, we'd love to kind of collect some of that ephemera and kind of uh, create our own archive. Um, uh, uh, an art action log that comes from this series. Uh, I think it'd be uh, a nice continuum to have throughout these conversations to see what what action comes from some of these conversations and um, really like uh, uh, so when we can kind of bring that into our next conversation. And, um, and, and speaking of that next conversation, uh, the next topic is going to be uh, wellness at home and in community. So uh, we're going to be uh, discussing some of those um, issues that came up during lockdown on uh, um, self-care and really like um, this huge um, uh, call for for um, uh, safety guidelines and ev everything, the vaccine as, uh, as we've talked about today, but we're going to go really in depth about um, community care and self-care. And uh, if nobody else has any questions, I'm just going to say thank you to William, uh, Dan, uh, Dan McCleary, William Camargo. Uh, thank you, Irene Satsas, for monitoring the, the chat and helping out in the, in the background. And thank you, Leslie, for your question. Thank you, everybody, for attending tonight and sharing this evening with us.